From MTN News, this is Face the State. Welcome, I'm Augusta McDonald. Thank you for joining us for Face the State. This week, Montana became the first state in the nation to pass a bill banning TikTok. Now many small business owners who rely on the app for marketing are left wondering what the future will hold if Governor Greg Gianforte signs that into law. MTN's Haley Monaco reports. Controversy over the popular app TikTok has been in the news for months now, but on Friday, Montana became the first state to approve a bill that could ban the app. Senate Bill 419 would make it illegal to download TikTok in Montana if Governor Greg Gianforte signs it into law. Entities that distribute the app to users in the state could be fined up to $10,000 a day. I went from, you know, like 100 followers to like 20,000 which is insane. While users would not be fined, a ban of the video streaming app still worries many like Shauna White Bear, who markets her business, White Bear Moccasins, on TikTok. TikTok reaches a, a larger, broader audience um, versus Instagram. Bill to ban TikTok in Montana. Weeks ago, China shocked our nation and our state when it flew a surveillance balloon over Montana and other parts of our nation. But now that audience could be ripped away from White Bear, who testified at the Senate hearing in March, hoping to make an impact. Shutting down TikTok and putting its makers' livelihoods at risk is not going to stop people from making bad decisions. I just, I just expected more from Montanians. But if it's a, if it's a generation that is voting on this that doesn't understand like the app. Um, I don't know if they should be making these big decisions. Billings resident Xavier Strattenhein doesn't have a TikTok, but believes the potential ban that would go into effect January 1st, 2024 is an infringement on rights. Policymakers should work to create regulations that prioritize data privacy and security for all users rather than resorting to blanket bans on certain apps or technologies. Um, I do think this will withstand First Amendment scrutiny, uh, Madam Chair and Representative. Uh, again, we've done this in, in the least restrictive way we can. Uh, so the idea that this can't be done uh, is just simply not true. It, it can be done quite easily and there's a lot of data out there that that that's doable. The bill states reasonings for the ban include TikTok stealing information from users and promoting dangerous content. There definitely is some problems with data sharing, but that's happening on Facebook. In Billings, Haley Monaco, MTN News. Lawmakers in the state legislature are re revising two bills that will have a major impact on the Montana transgender community. If you vote yes on this bill, and yes, on these amendments, I hope the next time there's an invocation, when you bow your heads in prayer, you see the blood on your hands. These are the comments Missoula Representative Zoe Zephyr made on the House floor Tuesday, arguing against a measure that would restrict health care for transgender youth, saying the law increases the risk of suicide. Now, she may not be able to speak for the rest of the session on any bill unless she apologizes. I'm not uh, silencing anybody. This is, uh, there's a path forward. Uh, it's in the rules. Um, to acknowledge recognition or not, uh, once again, anybody, any representative that wants to debate within, within the decorum, I'm going to recognize them. Former MTN political reporter Mike Dennison covered the Montana legislature for 30 years. He told me he's seen decorum rules enforced before, but not quite like this. I've not seen anything quite that harsh meted out before. But as far as the rules being followed, you know, they're being followed but they're just being enforced in a rather draconian way in this situation. This all developing as several pieces of legislation restricting the rights of LGBTQ people in Montana advance in the final days of the session. The, the actual issue is being sort of uh, warped into really just a straight political debate. The bipartisan Montana American Indian Caucus spoke out in support of historically marginalized groups and Representative Zephyr. Democrats tried to get the rule overturned with a full House vote Thursday, but the move was voted down. Zephyr tells me she isn't going to apologize. I will punch in on every bill that I feel like I need to speak on on behalf of my constituents. And if the speaker is willing to recognize me, I will, I will speak on their behalf. My light is on. The House Majority Republican Party has voted twice now to support the Speaker's move on Thursday and again Friday. I'm still going to stand for the dignity and integrity of this House. Um, 
Please uphold the ruling of the chair. In Billings, Augusta McDonald for MTN News. What happens now? <laughs> what happens now? Yeah, like what's next? Like what if for the next three weeks, her constituents aren't represented, which is about 11,000 people? I'm not sure what's going to happen now. I, I don't really know what steps Representative Zephyr or the Democratic minority can take to override the ruling of the speaker, because that's what it would take. Or take it would it's going to take someone to blink, uh, either the speaker and the majority or Representative Zephyr. And until that happens, I don't really see a path forward to change the situation. It's possible there's something that I don't know about in the rules or uh, in the negotiation between the two sides. The Republicans have a 68-32 majority, so uh, they're not going to overrule the speaker on something like this. And that's where it stands right now. Uh, so until he relents or until Representative Zephyr apologizes, we're kind of at a stalemate here. And Representative Zephyr is not being allowed to talk on the floor. Um, Mike, you covered the Montana legislature for about 30 years. Um, what are some other examples of um, a, a, maybe a lawmaker being silenced on the floor for, um, you know, uh, well, violating um, decorum? Yeah. Um, I've seen many instances where someone has not recognized on the floor or where the, the chair of the body refuses to recognize someone for various reasons. You know, they might be mad at what they're saying. You know, th this, this happens on occasion. It's not very uh, common. And people have been made, have been forced to apologize in the past for saying something on the floor that uh, people regard as offensive, that's brought, um, breached a quorum, that sort of thing. This situation, though, is a little different. I've never seen a situation where a legislator has been told, you never get to speak again until you apologize. And also, you know, what she said, by the way, uh, Representative Zephyr has refused to apologize. What she said on the floor in the past when people have been Maybe to apologize, they usually have said something offensive, or something racist, you know, something sexist. That, but this time, what she has done is just make her case forcefully against this particular bill. You know, she said it in pretty harsh terms, but that's what she's doing. You know, she wasn't like uh, making racist comments or things like that. There's very little um, middle ground on this issue where it's like, um, you know, it's it's either you you agree uh, wholeheartedly with the rights of trans individuals to pursue and, you know, um, be recognized, but the question might become mushy when it becomes at what age uh, and things like that. Um, but I think that what we see right now is we're not having that conversation. We're having the conversation that is much more, that is much crasser, much more kind of I don't want to say ugly, but it's pretty, it's pretty harsh. We're not sort of talking about these issues in a, in a nuanced way. It's either it's wrong or it's, it's right. And I think what's, what's troubling is, you know, um, that doesn't leave a lot of room to, to find the middle ground that's really important for, for the people that we're actually talking about, uh, for like, how do you address questions of like, uh, young people who are in the midst of this, this, uh, transition or you know, are dealing with these um, gender dysmorphia issues, like we're not really talking about how do we address that. We're talking about this much broader sort of, um, is it real or not? Is it, is, it, is it a thing that we should even be discussing? And so what happens is all of that is, uh, the actual issue is being sort of uh, warped into really just a straight political debate because um, it appears that for, uh, at least some within the Republican Party, there is an ability to kind of um, really rally support around opposition to anything that appears to be um, trans friendly. And and similarly, I, on the other side, there is a there is a, an ability to really kind of rally support around. I mean, we probably some of the the most fervent protests we've seen in Helena this session are about these issues um, from supporters of trans rights. We'll be back with more Face the State right after this. Follow MTN's coverage of the 68th session online anytime at your local MTN website. Welcome back to Face the State. 
Welcome back to Face the State. Bipartisan efforts to address a crisis in mental health care in Montana are nearing the finish line at the Montana Legislature. But how did we get here? I spoke with experts to learn more about how they hope to rebuild a fractured system. In 2017, the Montana Legislature cut $200 million in state and matching federal dollars from the Department of Public Health budget. This took a big chunk out of the community-based case management in the state, which was a big part of Montana's mental health infrastructure for decades. It really went bad since about 2017, where our, our state-funded mental health system is just really in shambles. And while we can agree or disagree about how to rebuild it, both sides appear to really agree that we need to. Kuntz says communities lost case management for people with mental illness, and as the state's mental health infrastructure crumbled, their clients crumbled along with it. I was reporting on some of the immediate fallout. Mental health providers predicted the problems we're now seeing just a few years later. I've got people going into crisis, people calling me up, freaking out. How am I going to get to the doctor? How am I going to get to this? How am I? Next month I have, you know, cataract surgery. I can't, you know. I don't know who's going to do that. I don't know what to tell them. Feeling like they have been left to the wayside. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways, they, they have. And it's, it's really heartbreaking to see that every day. And when you take that away from people, inevitably, uh, you create chaos in the system. And I think these cuts have done that. Over time, rural mental health services dwindled. Mental health providers cut services. The number of people in crisis spiked, and so did the cost to the state. Mary Windecker was at Western Montana Mental Health Center several years ago and anticipated what we're seeing now. Putting people into a higher level of care, either the Montana State Hospital System or the detention facilities, facilities is much more expensive. So it's going to cost the state much more in the long run than people living individually in their communities. Windecker is now the head of the Behavioral Health Alliance of Montana. If there is a silver lining to this cloud, it is that it, it can no longer be ignored. The impacts in every single community, in every single sector of the community, um, everywhere across the board, mental health and substance use disorder was right out there for everybody to see. Now the Montana legislature is weighing multiple big ticket proposals. One of them brought by Republican Representative Bob Keenan of Big Fork. He's tasked with creating a measure to spend 300 million earmarked by Governor Greg Gianforte in the state budget proposal to fund behavioral health. You know, $300 million to the taxpayer sounds like a big chunk of money. Um, talk about what it looks like to establish a <laughs> continuum of care and what rebuilding an entire system means and looks like. $300 million is an absolute, it's a lot of money. What we've really tried to do is put those guardrails on it so that we are we can show the legislature and the people of the state of Montana that this is an honest, true commitment for the future. In Billings, Augusta McDonald, MTN News. There are several other measures lawmakers are considering. We'll continue to follow those to see what crosses the finish line. But first, let's listen in to hear more from Representative Keenan. 24 years ago, under the Roscoe administration, we had mental health managed care, and it was a private contract with a behavioral health company out of Baltimore, Maryland. It was a $400 million five-year contract, and it went very, very badly. So in the legislature, 1999, we needed to address that issue and we decided to cancel the contract. So then it, it fell on my laps to rebuild the public mental health system, which took, we, we had two months to do it because the fiscal year starts on July 1st, but we were able to get that started and then work on it for four or five years. That system worked fairly well. This is a, you know, it's a dysfunctional dynamic system that we understand that. It's a very challenging system, mental health. So at any rate, it worked out well for about 12 to 15 years until we had projected revenue shortfalls and the provider rates were cut. The community level services fell apart and that's the situation that we find ourselves in now. All the way from homeless shelters, all the way to Warm Springs, we have, we have challenges. And so the governor's office and the Department of Public Health and Human Services approached me at the beginning of this session. We all knew coming into this session that mental health was one of the major challenges that the legislature would have to take on. I couldn't be more impressed that the governor's budget office 
set aside 10% of the surplus, a $3 billion surplus. So set aside $300 million to assess and rebuild the public mental health and the developmental disability system. That's where we are now. Talk a little bit about the funding cuts in 2017 that effectively kind of um, uh, yeah. dismantled um, some key parts of the system and uh, talk about um, the, the decision at the time mm -hmm. to cut all of that money out of the general fund to public health and then um, the, the kind of ripple effects that we've seen. And then, of course, COVID enhanced a lot of the issues that probably would have already been there. Yes, so we were uh, we were challenged um, with revenue shortfalls. In other words, tax revenue came down. That was the projection. So the governor's budget office uh, made some recommendations. We ended up having a special session and we came in here and we adopted the governor's proposals to cut the provider rates to get through because the major areas of the budget, the state employee pay plan or the educational funding, you can't cut them. So unfortunately, when we get to situations where there's a revenue shortfall, we have a special session, we need to cut the budget, Department of Health and Human Services ends up being the target. And where does that fall? That falls on the hundreds of contractors that provide services for those people who can't take care of themselves or struggle taking care of themselves. So that happened. And what we had developed over the previous 12 or 15 years was a fairly decent community crisis response system. When you start cutting provider rates then in the communities, then that system falls apart. And we cycle into this reality that we're in right now, where people who present themselves in a mental health crisis oftentimes end up in the hands of law enforcement. Their choice then is the emergency room and hospitals are not equipped to handle mental health crises or those people go to jail. We're in a situation right now, as an aside, where in the Department, uh, well, in the Department of Corrections in War in um, Deer Lodge, the uh, state prison, up to 35% of the prisoners who are in Deer Lodge are on psychotropic medication. Jail is not a good option for mental health services. So <clears throat> we got to that. We got to that point, and we. It, the community system started to collapse. And I think that's where we are right now, where people are presenting at warming, uh, warming shelters, homeless shelters, and the options are limited. They end up at the emergency room or jail. So that's where we need to start. Part of this big initiative that we are beginning will to, is setting aside $70 million in the next two years to bridge the gap as we assess what our dysfunctional system is right now and then move forward, we're going to need to set up some psych evaluations at warming centers on a voluntary basis, but we need to reestablish the community crisis response and mental health. Follow MTN's coverage of the 68th session online anytime at your local MTN website. Welcome back to Face the State. And new this week, lawmakers suspended the rules to allow for a bill to be heard that has major implications for Northwestern Energy and the company's proposed gas plant in Laurel. House Bill 971 was passed on party lines out of the House Natural Resources Committee on Tuesday. It says greenhouse gas emissions cannot be considered in environmental reviews. It was introduced after a Yellowstone County judge ruled Northwestern Energy must halt construction on the Laurel plant until there's a more thorough review of its environmental impacts. Opponents of the legislation did not hold back their anger at the bill's initial hearing on Monday. House Bill 971 should be opposed. It is a knee-jerk reaction to protect a monopoly utility, Northwest Energy, development that threatens our air, water, and climate. I would like to see things that affect our immediate environment be thoroughly discussed with as much time as is necessary to come to a consensus, not hurried through in what appears to me to be a clear smashing grab for control. 
Meanwhile, the bill's sponsor says the judge's decision to shut down the plant's construction was misguided. Montana has not enacted carbon regulations, yet despite the clear direction, the court have decided that MEPA is now a tool for regulation of carbon. <clears throat> The legislature must act to correct this blatant misinterpretation of the law and overreach by the courts. More than 100 people have now been laid off on that project. They were tasked with building the new plant on the banks of the Yellowstone River in Laurel. Some Laurel residents are concerned about the lack of oversight at the new plant if this bill passes. I'm concerned about Laurel. I'm concerned about the, the neighborhood south of the river. And I'm concerned about everyone who's downwind. Today, the wind's in my back. So it's the people southeast of here that's going to get it. The plants union says about 50 employees remain working at the construction site after this week's layoffs. Right now, their job is to put equipment away, getting it out of the weather while waiting to find out if this bill will pass. Follow MTN's coverage of the 68th session online anytime at your local MTN website. Welcome back to Face the State. Joining us now, we have MTN senior political reporter, Jonathan Ambarian. Jonathan, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Augusta. So um, coming up, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of winding down the session. Um, one big, uh, the, the big ticket item, the, the budget is still in the works. Um, what can we expect to see with House Bill 2? Right, the budget, uh, the state budget is the one thing that the legislature has to uh, get done before they leave town. Uh, and yeah, we're to the, uh, about, uh, we're, we're coming up on the 80th, day out of 90 here at the legislature so about two weeks left and yeah so the the budget the main budget bill house bill two it made its way through the house and now through a senate budget committee and now it's on it uh excuse me it's it's into the senate floor uh for consideration and so once they get it finalized uh then it'll have to go back to the house the senate has already made some changes and so the house has to decide whether or not to accept the changes. If they accept the changes, which uh, having talked to our uh, former uh, chief political reporter, Mike Dennison, he says it has happened, uh, but not a lot of times in the sessions that he's covered, uh, then that's the big ticket item out of the way potentially next week and, and things will really start moving towards wrapping up. If they reject the changes, then the bill has to go to a conference committee to iron out the differences between the House and Senate version. And that could certainly take a lot longer. Okay, again, MTN senior political reporter, Jonathan Ambarian, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much.